Hey guys, welcome into another episode of From the Wing. I am Christian Clark, the Pelicans beat writer for NOLA.com and the Times Picayune. I am not reporting live outside the Smoothie King Center today. I am inside a hotel in downtown Portland. I was with the Pelicans in their first two games of this trip out west here, which have both been fun, eventful games. We've got a great show for you today. We're going to talk about one crazy week for the Pelicans. We're going to discuss what I thought was Zion Williamson's best game in the NBA Sunday in Phoenix. We're going to talk about going small, which I think we're only going to see more and more. And then at the end of the show, we're going to get into some of these playoff play-in scenarios. Adam, let me let me paint the picture here for what was an insane week in Pelicans land. Last Wednesday, they lose to the Magic. Zion hits his left hand on the backboard while trying to block Jalen Suggs, and his middle finger on his left hand is in pain. He doesn't play like the final seven minutes of the game, gets an X-rayed, nothing structurally wrong with it, but he's got it wrapped up. Friday, Zion sits out the Spurs game with what the Pelicans describe as a finger contusion. The Pelicans lose, panic, disaster, awful loss. Suddenly, they're not in control of their fate to make the playoffs anymore. They're behind the Suns. They badly need to win Sunday's game in Phoenix to even have a chance. Oh my God, they do it. Zion is incredible. Uh, <laughs> so many other things happen in this game. Tuesday, they take care of business against the Trailblazers and they wake up Wednesday morning in sole possession of sixth place in the Western Conference. They go 3-0 in their final three games. They guarantee themselves a playoff spot. It looked like they were veering toward the iceberg. And now I think we're going to avoid the iceberg. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> or maybe we're just Billy Zane running with and grabbing that kid by the lifeboat saying, I have a child. Just like trying to get off the boat. Could be that. Or maybe, maybe we don't hit the iceberg. Um, the, this was a, just a stupid set of games and I don't, I don't know. There's not a lot to this is like what we expect, right? This is it's, the stuff. it's never boring with this team. It's never boring. We, we joked about this weeks ago. We were like we were looking at like the final 14 games and the final 10 games. And we're like, all right, surely we're not going to do the thing where the final three games decide everything. Surely we're not going to do California back to back road trip and then Lakers game and all of them means certain doom or victory for the season. And now your only path to 50 wins is to win all three. And your only surefire path to six is to win all three. Um, the Spurs game sucked. Sp you mentioned the Orlando game, so I'm just going to go back and reference that, that I was there, and that was one of the most miserable games I have ever been to. They were bad nothing worked this is the orlando thing like that is a team that we physically they just have a lot of big stuff inside if they hit any of their threes they're a huge problem for us because they can just do a lot of stuff um would have liked to see those zion middies that he pulled out in phoenix in that orlando game but needless to say spurs i'm afraid of Wemby, no matter who's on the roster like he could just do the thing and make them win a game at any time. And he didn't shoot well. Like, they did a good job doubling him early in the first half. They did a lot of good stuff in the first half. He didn't He didn't yet, make a field goal until the 11-minute mark in the third quarter. He did not have a field goal in the first half. He started, like, 0 for 8 or something. It was it was ridiculous. Um, and they did a good job. Like, they were, they were somewhat tough shots. He did also have, like, he had one where it was like a... I can't even call it a layup because layups for him means he physically put the ball on the rim with his hand. Um, it just kind of, he put it up, it should have gone in and it just rolled right off the rim. Like we had some luck going for us too with that. And then like, we were like, this isn't going to happen. This, this is, is this happening? This is going to happen. Is this happening? And it happened. Um, when when Devontae so Graham hit that three at the end of the third quarter to tie the game, that was a full on. This is happening. I mean, I, I I turned to my left and right, and the people sitting next to me, I was like, "Okay, I I think I know what's going to happen here." Sadly, it had to be him too. It had to be him. Of all the people in the NBA, it could be. It's got to be Devonte Graham. I've got people tweeting, "Wow, it'd be really cool if he played for the Pelicans." I'm like, are you? You didn't write that. You didn't just write that. Don't do this. Don't do this right now. Oh, 
anyway, yeah, he shot the lights out. Uh, as we know, Devontae Graham can do like a handful of times a year, and he did it in that game. He scored 20-plus. Uh, he was on an absolute heater, and we were leaving him open, which doesn't help. Um, we were a mess, and we were very afraid of Wemby, understandably so. Defensively and creation-wise, he still did all the Wemby things. That's one of the the things like when we're all freaking out and talking about like how Wemby's taking over the entire league. He was terrible offensively to start that game. He made really bad decisions in those early double teams. He made some really bad passes. He missed a lot of shots, including ones that were open. But the blocks, the assists, the transition stuff, and just shutting down the lane for entry all still happens. So he's already doing like the stuff that we're going to rave about Zion starting to do finally now. Wemby does from day one. The question mark for him is the other side. It's being efficient offensively. And I think everything else we're seeing around him is like, it, it's going to happen. So like, congratulations, everybody. We've got next year, maybe to like, try to win the West. And then we just get, you know, the rest of Joker and the beginning of Wemby clashing over and over and over again, while the rest of us just suffer underneath them. Um, yeah. I, th I mean, Victor Wembanyama. I don't even think it's hyperbolic to say he has a chance to become the greatest defensive player in NBA history. Like that, that is his ceiling. And, you know, offensively, he does some freaky stuff. I mean, we've just seen that if, you know, you, you can't like handle the ball, you know, like there's a limit on you as a big man and he can kind of handle the ball and we'll see it really help them to get a real point guard in there. But defensively is where this guy is just amazing. Like he, he might win six or seven defensive player of the years. He, I mean, they, he easily has he, that potential. He is probably like, this is so ridiculous. He is probably going to have, and this is like, if he will probably have the highest blocks average in a single season ever, he will probably rewrite that stat himself several times. And he will very likely have, if, if he gets health, if he gets to, if his body hangs out and hangs in there, which, Hey, he didn't miss anything because he was actually hurt this year. It was just like protection days. If he hangs in there, we're talking about like blocks wise, blocks, rebounds, and then like assists coming with that. It's so stupid. Yeah. He's he's probably gonna be he's probably gonna have the most blocks in NBA history if he has a healthy career. Like and it's we can say that now. You can you can see the Durant influence in his game. Um I love Victor Wembanyama. his uh, approach like mentally um just how he prepares his body to like get through an 82 game season already seems super advanced um i mean this guy is the real deal all right let's let's get into the suns game because i mean this was the most important game that is that has happened this season so far on the on the one and five homestand the pelicans got torched again by devin booker devin booker scored 52 points you know like it just felt kind of hopeless against the Suns. Maybe not hopeless, but it felt improbable that the Pelicans could go into Phoenix and get a win, given what Devin Booker had done to New Orleans in three straight games. And, oh my gosh, they freaking did it. I thought defensively, the Pelicans did a lot better job of showing Victor Wembanyama different looks, actually playing with some force and making it harder on him on the defensive end. Um, you know, Herb was on him. Dyson was on him. They double teamed him at times. And, you know, Booker was good, but, you know, he just, he didn't have a game where he was so good. It's like Im impossible for the Pelicans to even win. And Zion Williamson was clear cut best player on the floor, said it at the top of the show. It was his best game as a professional, considering the stakes 29 points, 10 rebounds, seven assists, five blocks. Zion had never had more than three blocks in an NBA game before. Oh, and did I mention? He made not one, but two jump shots, Adam. Two of them. They weren't just jump shots either. These were midi pull-ups, saw the wall, went over the wall, and it was decisive. It was aggressive. He knew he was doing it from the second he dribbled past the arc. The help stuff on the blocks. It's He's comfortable in the defense now. Like These, these are blocks. These are blocks he's going to make. Like, these are the ones he's going to get. He is shielding off a defender. He's in rebounding position or put back position with a defender on his back. 
So and the in front of the shooter. So he's helping on the shooter and getting these blocks, but he's still in a good position or he's challenging from an area where even if he doesn't get the block, he's in the way of an outlet pass. It's like one of them, he helped off the corner. Helping out of the corner can be really, really bad. Not if you're him and you jump into the passing lane to make the block. So like he's he's vacating his man, but there's not a path to get the ball to that guy. He is getting comfortable and aggressive. The block from behind KD to take away, like at, he he had two of them where he got dribbled past and then pursued the block and took it away. And that's LeBron stuff. Yep. That is LeBron erasure type stuff. Like he's the only player we have ever seen like, oh, you beat me on two parts of this defensive rep. Let me just take it off the board. That's what he did. That's how good it was. The, the Durant block from behind was just, silly like that was overwhelming athleticism right there that was 0.00001 percent athleticism um you know one of my my biggest gripes about you know zion and his five years as a pro is if you watch those games at duke guy was a freak on the defensive end steals and blocks monster you know creating turnovers getting out on the break and 360 dunks like just snatching people's souls with his defensive playmaking and then getting out on the break. You've not seen that a lot in the NBA. And I think most of it honestly has been related to conditioning. He's just not been in great condition for most of his time as a pro. I think one of the best indicators of is Zion in shape is his steals and blocks numbers. And if you look at them month by month this season, there was a really big uptick in the month of March. I tweeted out that like those splits of, you know, probably a week or two ago or something like that. Um, you know, if Zion is having these five block games, I mean, obviously it means he is engaged and really wants to win the game, but it also indicates to me that this guy is in great shape. Um, and like, you know, we've, we've had a lot of these moments lately where it's looked like, oh, we're, we're getting Duke Zion again. And I, I think a lot of people thought that guy is, is no longer in there in December. Like, I think a lot of people coming out the, the in-season tournament loss to the Lakers, like. Look, we just have to accept that that Duke Zion is never coming back. And, you know, while this guy is still good, don't get me wrong, he's still good. He's just not going to ever be that guy. And we've had some moments lately, Sunday being the biggest one of, yeah, he's he's still in there. And this is him now. Yeah, it. I mean, it took reps. Like, we saw this progress. We saw in January the defense started to uptick before the stocks did. You started seeing him get in better position. He started being a guy you couldn't attack as easily, and it's built since then. The other thing about that time is like post IST is when we saw like a leap in professionalism. We're hearing from CJ that he's doing off day workouts every single day, and he's got plans for every. He's communicating what his off day workouts are and all these things. He's on a schedule. All the stuff we were like yearning for. What a surprise. We start to see the reps get better, and as he's able to do more of the good rotation reps, he starts getting adventurous because he's comfortable in the reps. And now, now, like we saw a couple of games before this where he is calling his number. He's saying, Kawhi is my matchup. He's saying, you need me on that guy. We've seen like just little, a little bit of this stuff start to build. And then maybe a question mark with the Spurs game. But then this... Is, is more of what we were seeing before. Like, I'm taking the challenge. I am asserting myself into the game, regardless of whether it's going to be my offense that brings us home. I am going to bring us home. What What do you think the narrative would have been, the Pelicans' narrative, if they had not won Sunday in Phoenix? Uh, complete collapse, sell everybody, sell the team. National, <laughs> national stuff would have been terrible. National stuff would have been so bad. They couldn't do the fat thing, though. But they would absolutely do the, is he a professional, really? Can we believe in them? And then the worst part was that we would just like not get mentioned anymore. Because like I said, I don't care what they say about us. The measure of respect for me is just the fact that we even got mentioned because we made them do it. Yeah. Even if it's bad and they don't know what's going on, they don't know who's playing or who does what, at least they talked about us. I, I think if the Pelicans had not won on Sunday, those narratives would have been brutal. And I think there would have been maybe some uh, more examination of, wait, Zion didn't play against 
the Spurs in a game the Pelicans really needed to win. And now people are not going to talk about that. And I get it because, you know, this guy <laughs> looked like, a, you know, an all NBA player, a top 10 player in the league on Sunday. I mean, he was the, he was the best player on the court. He was on the court with Devin Booker and Kevin Durant, and it wasn't even really close. Um, I mean, it was it was just ridiculous stuff. And you can, man, Zion is so confounding at times, but I would say broadly, he really wants to be in the playoffs. Like that is something that means to him. You could see it when he talks. You could see it in just the intensity with which he's playing with lately. I just think... I think it genuinely did hurt him not to be able to play in that first round series against the Suns two years ago. And that is something he wants to be part of. He wants to experience that stage. And one one thing we didn't mention about what would have gone wrong is we'd have had to have a serious conversation, probably for the first time. I think you and I are as like I think we're pretty well rounded on the topic of coaching and like when to have that discussion and when not to. Like we are not very reactive to that stuff. We kind of you, you can't have it after every game because each yeah. game is one point two percent of the regular season. So right. it's just I think it's silly to do it after every game. Like I think you can do but, it at spots. But yes, continue. But <laughs> if they if if something went bad in Phoenix, there was not going to be a choice but to look at the rest of this season through the lens of is Willie going to be the guy for this right now? Because he is early in his coaching career. Like we, I reject the talking about him after every single loss, a single ATO or a single player mistake is not a coaching issue. We, the main thing is still the main thing with him. And it's something we've mentioned, but we don't harp on and jump on. And it's the live game adjustment when it comes to his lineups and his rotations, it's not a singular lineup thing. It is this choice. And like to get a little nuanced on it, it is a choice kind of specifically revolving around Larry to give defensive role discipline to his lineups and his rotations for everyone else. Even when Larry is showing you his ass and it's because there's not a trustworthy other option at the five, there was just like this paralysis in specifically in that Spurs game to do anything else. And I think I felt better in the Suns game very, very quickly because we saw like a little scotch of bad and then immediately a small ball lineup. Oh God, look, Herb's at the five. This is cool. This is different. It's already different. Okay. Memo received. We can't just do it the same old way we've been doing. Maybe that's our foray into the small ball stuff. Well, regarding that Spurs game, I keep checking the injury report and it keeps saying Cody Zeller face mask available. <laughs> and yeah, we're, we're, I, guess, I guess we're just never going to see him, but whatever. Um, if, yes. Leadership was important for, for us to make this playoff run. <laughs> Veteran, Co veteran leadership and championship minutes. Work. Cody Zeller is a, uh, he is like a great guy, man. Look, um, he's doing, he, they made him Garrett Temple. I'm watching him on the sideline and he's, he's as excited and enthusiastic and as supportive as and, any human being on every possession. Yeah, I'm watching him. Yes. The only, the only thing I can say is like against some of those bad teams when the Larry minutes aren't working, like I am like, yeah, why, not? why not? Why not? But why anyways, not? to your point, the Larry minutes were, much better against the Suns. Really, like the thing we saw in that game was the Pelicans started very poorly. They committed four turnovers in the first four minutes of the game. 805 mark. They're down nine to four. Willie Green calls a timeout and he does something interesting. He subs Jonas Valanciunas off. He puts Dyson Daniels into the game. Dyson Daniels is effectively the Pelicans five for a couple of minutes there. He was guarding Yusuf Nurkic. Nurkic tried to post him up twice right when he came onto the court. Neither of those times worked. I think Dyson did a solid job. I think also Nurkic was awful in that game. And that was like one of the biggest reasons the Suns lost that game was Nurkic just couldn't make anything at the rim and played extremely poorly. The Pelicans basically went small for the final 44 minutes of that game with, with Dice and Larry in there a lot at the five. And in this one game, it worked for the Pelicans. Yeah, the and like credit to Larry for so 
say the negative thing about Larry. I'll say the positive thing too. The thing that absolutely killed us in the last Suns matchup, as much as Devin Booker dropped 50 on them, was the fact that we could not stop Yusuf Nurkic from getting offensive rebounds. He was tap. He was tapping every single thing back to the three point arc, and I mean, it was two and three times on the same possession that was just murdering any chance you had of being in that game for real. They did. Everybody did a much better job with him. They made his life much more difficult than it was. And look, I was sitting there. I was sitting there in the first quarter, and I I texted people during the first half, and I'm like, "Y'all, the small ball stuff." is working. Nurkic is in hell. We, the five out stuff was really, really giving him problems too. Like they, the Suns, one of the biggest things we haven't even talked about yet. Part of going small is the ability to go five out on the other side. Even if Larry can't make the corner three standing in the corner and changing that setup and opening up the paint is something. And if you're able to knock down the shots, thank you, Jose, for coming in and doing that for us. Um, that's, changes things from how you have to defend and Phoenix would not take a true center off the floor. So they take Nurkic off. They try Eubanks. They try Eubanks with Bull Bull. Then they leave Bull Bull on, bring Nurkic back in, try him together. Bull Bull was terrible. Just throwing that out there. But uh, every, every single center got cooked. Every center couldn't do anything. They needed to go small. They needed to do KD at the five and they didn't, they just didn't do it. And when they didn't, like, you just got to keep going. Like, I know instinctively we're all doing the, should JV come back in here before this gets out of hand? But the small ball stuff was killing them. It was legitimately giving them problems at both ends. Um, and he stuck with it and kind of kept going. Larry survived. Larry was aggressive. That's the other thing. He gave, them something, he gave them something on offense, yeah. Yeah, and he's a different player sometimes. And I don't know what does it. The Larry that's willing to dribble the whole floor when they don't expect it and find Trey on a back cut is a different player. Like that guy can do this, throw some ass, and maybe he doesn't have, you know, maybe he only has five rebounds because the wings have the rebounds and he's just clearing guys out. But I need that guy. Be willing to take the shot. Sure. Maybe it goes down, maybe it doesn't. But the guy that dribbles the whole floor and finds Trey on the baseline, that's useful. One of the most important stats from this game, 42 to 38, that was the rebounding battle. The Pelicans won it. Willie Green has said all season, he's like, look, if we go small, we have to be competitive in the rebounding department. And I think that's been, you know, one of the small ball units biggest issues is they just get crushed on the boards a lot when, when Larry's out there. And, you know, certainly if you're going to go with like Dyson at the five. And I think that was a huge part of the win in Sunday, them being competitive on the class. And you know what helps? In the rebounding battle, when your very large, very athletic power forward grabs 10 of them, like Zion can really help here. Um, if he's able to get some rebounds, I think Dyson is a, a really good rebounder for a guy kind of of his position, his size. I, I like what he contributes there. The Pelicans did enough there to, you know, like make the possession battle pretty even, basically. So you're saying Zion can jump a little bit. <laughs> he is he's able to leap this is a surprise this is news yeah yeah that's that is what i'm saying and Look, trey trey had a couple of good ones too um he's had some trouble containing the ball he's he's gone up for a lot of rebounds and there's he's had some some struggles bringing the ball down with two hands when guys have challenged him but he had a couple of huge rebounds in that game too where like we needed yeah. to have it and he decided before the possession i'm gonna jump a foot higher than everybody else so he had a couple of cool rebounds in there too that were really important. Let's talk about the Zion jumpers. Uh, somebody got it. Somebody sent me the clip of Joel Meyer's reaction. I was at the game, so I wasn't able to watch it on TV of Joel's reaction when Zion hit one of them, and he was like, "Zion, he got it!" Like he just lost his mind. Like it, it feels <laughs> like Pelicans um, Twitter, Pelicans fans. Like we lose our collective minds when this solar eclipse of Zion Williamson hitting a jump shot happens. I saw, I did not see the actual solar eclipse, but I told, I saw two solar eclipses inside that footprint center on Sunday when Zion Williamson made one from 15 feet. And then he made one from 13 feet. Yes, please, please start taking two or three of these 
every game. I don't care if it's an efficient shot or not. I just want it in the back of the defense's mind that he is willing to take this. And one of the, so Zion and and Giannis Antetokounmpo, I think they're somewhat comparable players, right? These are guys who they want to get into the rim. They want to finish inside. They want to get to the free throw line. Not a ton in their games offensively outside of that. They're either going to try to get the rim, get to the rim and finish, or they're going to pass. Giannis Antetokounmpo is willing to take wide open jumpers. And he is by no means a great jump shooter, but he'll take them from time to time. And I like that. And I think one of the differences between Giannis and Zion is you can't embarrass Giannis. Like he's going to, he could miss two or three jumpers in a row. He could miss four or five free throws. And he's like, whatever, this happens. I'm not going to be perfect. And Zion has talked about this. He, he, he views it as I have like a strain of perfectionism where you know, I think he really likes going 10 of 13 from the field. I don't think he wants to go 10 of 22. He doesn't like missing shots. And I think he, I think he needs to get to a place where it's just okay to make mistakes. Like I do not care if you're missing some of these mid range jumpers, like you need to continue to develop the shot. This will be critical for your development. If you can just pull up and not have to try to climb over the wall and just shoot a nice little lefty jumper over it. Yep. Um, he, I mean, the reason we all freaked out is because nobody in the NBA world expected those two possessions to be those shots. Like we've all been rope doped for five years and he just threw the haymaker. We're like, huh? he practices them. He practices yeah. them. And now, so do, do you have any, you have any feel for like how long he's been practicing those? I mean, years and years. I mean, even when Teresa Witherspoon was here, like you'd see them like, him pulling up for mid range jumpers. I mean, you go to shoot around every single day and he's, he's taking corner threes. Yeah. Um, and you know, he just never takes threes and it's whatever. Like to me, I would much rather him develop the, the 15 foot, you know, a pull up jumper between the 10 and 15 foot range and then a corner three. I mean, the, the corner three, sure. That'd be, that'd be, that'd be good, I guess. But like, just get that little pull up. So you don't have to like, you know, put, I guess, make your body go through like any more like traumatic events at the rim that it needs to be because you're already doing that 15 times a game. And here's the thing, the the options that's going to give him like we're talking about a guy that's a talented passer. If he gets comfortable with that shot specifically, he's going to have guys in the corner that when he leaps, if he wants to make a pass out of that, like this is something Jokic is like, it's fundamental to his game that you can't tell when he takes a shot, whether it's going to be a shot or a pass. And like, cause he'll take it from funky angles and stuff. If Zion can get comfortable with that and he'll get, he'll have options to create out of it. God forbid we get him any level of athletic five that can be on the baseline in those moments too. Cause he just will not be able to see the wall anymore. The wall will be one or two guys, not three. That's been the issue is you can load up on them and there's not a lot of options. This is one way to take it down. This is the first step in taking it down. If he gets that stuff, it's impossible to defend him. It's just going to be impossible to defend him. And it, like you said, focus like small things. A lot of people want to do like this perfect growth of a player, go away in the summer and come back and have everything. That's not reality in the NBA. The best players in the world add like one little thing that they feel comfortable using in the following season. This is the thing we want to see him use. This is, this is the thing that's attainable. The form when he goes up is like reminiscent of LeBron. Like he's pushing his body back and using the strength. He's creating separation with the jump and he just turns and does it so quickly that like, dude, the, the between the legs, three times pull up, like that's every point guard in the NBA. And, and he did it and it looked really good. And, uh, Joel said that on the on the broadcast was like, look how smooth it looks. Like this looks good. It looks like something he can pull off. And, and Zion is not a guy who goes fifth, like he's not Shaq at the free throw line. Like he is going seventy percent at the free throw line. Like it's just good enough to where you think, okay, there's there's the touch there needed to be able to get to be a guy who hits a couple or at least attempts you know a couple mid range jumpers a game and and makes one of them a game makes two of them a game. I mean, I just think even something as small as that, like if Zion is making one 
15 footer every game. Like I think that could go such a long way. Defenses have to think of you a little bit differently, less wear and tear on your body. As you said, it, it creates like passing lanes for you that, that didn't exist previously. I think this would be huge for Zion. And I think it was great to see that in Phoenix. And like, I just think he needs to get to a place mentally where he's like, I, I, I have to be comfortable taking these, like whatever you have to do. I think, you know, next season and going forward, like he has to, to be comfortable taking these from time to time. I think it's huge for him. That's the dream now is like the dream end of season is that he takes these in every game going forward. And that small ball comes to us and gets used in all of these games. And we get like reps of it to the point where it's like a reliable thing we deploy in the playoffs. That's like, that's the the dream scenario is get to six and see a little bit of what we just saw in this Phoenix game and in the Portland game, see that trickle in, get Brandon back, add him to that. Yeah, I asked uh, Willie Green for Brandon Ingram update before Tuesday's game in Portland. Um, Brandon did a, a little bit in the Pelicans practice on Monday. He is playing a one-on-one -on -one at this point, which seems okay. Um, you know, he's going to have to get the five on five and like probably go through a practice before he's back on the court. I'm mentally at the point where I'm like, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, we'll see what happens before these two games in California, but I'm like, well, can he get back for the Lakers game? And if not, can the Pelicans clinch a top six seed so they can give Brandon that extra runway to come back? Because the Pelicans are in the playing tournament that takes place the 16th through 19th of next week. If they make the playoffs. That doesn't start till the 20th. Like you just get, you know, four or five extra days to not only kind of, you get extra time to know who your opponent is, but like that could be valuable time for the reintegrate reintegration process of a Brandon Ingram too. So there's, you know, all these reasons you want to be able to, to get a top six seed. Um, the Pelicans woke up Wednesday, one game ahead of the Suns. The Suns on the head to head tiebreaker. They got to maintain that one game if, if, you know, they want to get to the playoffs outright. Yeah. So we're in, we're in quite the, quite the scenario now where like, you look at the rest of the Suns' schedule. The Suns have the worst schedule out of anybody. They're playing away to a lot of really good teams. They play the Clippers again in a back-to-back -to -back tonight. Um, we're hoping to hear that Kawhi plays in that game. Fingers crossed. But they just got cooked by Paul George and Russ. So, and I'll have to mention Amir Coffey, who saved us from Russ potentially pissing that game away in fourth quarter if anybody switched over. Because as soon as I saw the Portland game was cooked, I'm like, let me jump over here and see what's happening. Oh, God, Russ is giving the ball away over and over and over again. They're almost back. They got it to six. Terrifying. And then PG just kind of stepped in there. He had some sloppy turnovers, too. But he got fouled like three or four times in a row, went to the line, made the shots, just did the like all around, you know, everything everybody loves about Paul George. He can just kind of do it all. He just kind of like has a really, really fluid offense, just kind of fits. Uh, and they they brought it home. But Clippers and Mavs are just playing around for four or five. They're, they're in and done. Six is open for us. Kings kind of like don't have tiebreakers against the right teams, so the Kings look screwed. And without Monk and Herter, they're just – it's an uphill battle for them. But they play all of us. So the Kings are going to kind of decide how the rankings shake out. Like if they get a win, any win they get against a non pelican team is great because they're playing everybody. Um, but the Suns got to do all this stuff away. They got these two like really, really bad losses back to back that like had to feel rough. KD and book went deep in that game to try and claw it back. They were down 30 plus. At, up for a large portion of that game, and now they got to potentially play Kawhi tonight. They finished. Was it Minnesota. was it thirty seven to ten after the first quarter? Brother, it was almost. Had Book not gotten to the line a few times, it was four. It was four points with like a minute and a half left in that quarter. It was the craziest thing I've ever seen. And then when you like watch the, like how the game's going, like sure book and Durant are missing shots. And that's part of it. Like I think they, they started like three of 18, but you can't, the offense can't be, can't debilitate down to Grayson Allen and Royce O'Neal get us out of here. And that's what it was. And so I'm like, okay, they start this comeback. They come back, they bring it back from like 25, 26 points. They get it down to under 20. I'm like, 
are they really going to still be 15 points better the rest of the way against Paul George? I don't think so. And they didn't make it. Um, so they didn't get – it was scary for a second there. But anyway, back to the picture. Adam, so we have you, the tiebreaker. You know, against by the, the way, do you know yep. what the Suns are going to have to pay in, in luxury tax payroll? Oh, not offhand. No, I don't. $191 million. Nice. Nice. Yep. Hundred and hundred and ninety-one million dollars in luxury tax. That's that's what they're on the hook for this year for a team that we'll see how this goes. They might not get playoff games. Bradley Beal is not that good. It hasn't it hasn't looked very good. And KD for like I'm not I'm in no way gonna besmirch KD. He is still an incredible player. But he does feel old for the first time. Like he does feel older and a little banged up and feels like he's missing shots more often than he's always made. This is the first season I've ever looked at him without like a real big time injury designation and been like, I don't mind just making sure I keep the ball out of books hands. Like now that's the goal of teams playing against them. Also their offense is kind of a mess. None of them is a point guard, but all of them are the point guard. Kind of sounds like us. Um, but <laughs> You know, yeah, it, weird team. They're not they're not built very well, and the stars really have to pump the gas to to get it to work. Do you how how big of a part is the Suns not being as potent offensively as it seems like they should be? Is is the the lack of a pure point guard? Do you think? I mean, for them, I didn't expect it to be much because we've seen Book in the point guard role before, and he had yeah. to do it, and it worked. And we've seen KD have those possessions, but. There's this weird thing with a through line through KD's entire career. We've asked a question from the very beginning of the OKC Thunder and like even Seattle Supersonics before they moved, where we were like, why doesn't this guy like just go super high utilization all the time? Like he makes everything. Why not just drop 50 so much more regularly? And it's just like the fluidity is part of his game. Like feeling games out and picking his spots has always been part of his game. But it like it's still you yearn for it because you see how great he is, and sometimes he'll take over for three or four possessions. The tough part really has been Brad Beal is not a point guard, and they kind of like they toy around with the idea of him being the point guard, but he's not. I think the biggest thing is like it's no one's job. They here at least we have an understanding that we we moved, we had this problem, and we moved to the majority of the time. This is going to be a Zion thing. And then when we need it to not be, here's the one person it's going to be. And we sprinkle in some herb initiation and some Jose and like Larry run the floor. But there are two primary ball handlers, the majority of the game. The Suns don't have that. It's a mishmash based on what they see on the floor. And the complementary pieces don't have ball handling ability at all. So they are really, really limited to just those three guys. And book like you need him to fill it up so much right now that I don't really want him on the ball a ton trying to initiate offense. You kind of need it to be Beal, and it hadn't looked good. It hasn't looked good at all. It's a mess. Yeah, I mean, it, it, if if they don't make the playoffs, that's that's an absolute disaster. Like it's you know they're that's a big old tax bill. That's big. That's big yeah, the, and, they you know they're uh, it's going to be hard for them to like really change out their roster significantly because of, you know, where they are. It's a huge luxury tax bill. I mean, they had like a, you know, after they made the KD trade, it was like, we have a one and a half or two and a half year title contention window. Like, you know, like if given Kevin Durant's age is like next year is like the last year that it's like, okay, maybe, but like they're not even contenders right now. It doesn't seem like, so that is, uh, that is not good. Matt should be, uh, oh. Doing a lot of stuff, and some of it's been good, and some of it has not looked so good so far. I was gonna, I was gonna say that name because, like, all the positive PR, all the slam in here, and I'm the most popular guy in the NBA. I'm doing all the things. I'm giving it all away for free. Everybody wants to have me as an owner. <laughs> and now, like, let the, let them not make the playoffs or flame out. Let the Hunter Brooks story continue and get follow-ups 
and have people examine like, wait, is he really financing the purchase of the of the sons with mortgages like the actual policies? Huh? Uh, yeah, it's it can get it can get real dark real real fast. It's it's very, very interesting. And like, you know, I'm a salty asshole fan of a different team. That's not the sun. So downfall for everyone, you know, failure for all of my enemies. The last thing I want to say before we get out of here, CJ McCollum had a really bad second half against the Spurs. I mean, they they just had to go to him. They didn't have many other weapons. Shot five of 17. It was like brutal to look at, honestly. And he has responded with two excellent games against the Suns and against the Trailblazers, his old team. And look, I, I just think the... The ability to to put that one behind you where you have this awful shooting night and then really step up and make a bunch of threes against Phoenix and then against the Trailblazers is really impressive. Like that's that's the impressive part about like NBA players to me. It's like, man, like, you know, I, I'm mentally weak enough to where like if I had a game like that, I feel like it could snowball. And it's like, how do you how do you just move forward like that? Because that Spurs game was Awful, man. I mean, that was that was awful. Or, Orlando wasn't great either. Yeah. Orlando, like the middle, he he fixed it toward the end, but Orlando started real rough too. Like he went from, and we know this, right? He's older. We've seen him in the high utilization situations. We've seen him in the primary ball handler situations. We don't love it. We know that's not optimal. So for him to give you the great performance is not the expectation. And when we get it, like we should just respect it and and celebrate it because it, it is not what we expect right now. He was near perfect in these two games and he contributed defensively as well. And his decision-making like as a passer as well, like initiation against aggressive defenders and against size is difficult for him. We've seen it in a lot of matchups. He's got some pocket, some early pocket passes on pick and roll coverages that are, I like, I just didn't, wouldn't have even thought that the ball would get there and he made the pass before I even saw anything. And you're just like, oh, yeah, that's right. He's got that. He does have that. Hmm. But, yeah, he was he was truly, truly good. And, we, you know, we can't, we can't even touch on the Portland game. Like, we have to just at least say, like, awesome Trey Murphy game. Um, I want to see one of those come against a great team and not just, like, the teams that he knows he's better than. But great game nonetheless. He was lighting it on fire. And he made some good passes in that game, too. I don't think this is a revelation or anything, but Portland is a weird city, bro. <laughs> you got Good. some artisanal jams? Uh, yeah, man. It's a, it's a little bit different vibe than New Orleans, that's for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, this, I, my takeaway is that the sun is good for you. The sun is good for your overall health. Maybe Andrew Huberman, who has had six girlfriends at one time is onto something when he says the best thing you can do for yourself is go out and look at the sun for 10 minutes every morning because yeah, I don't, they don't see the sun a lot here and I think it shows. <laughs> Dude, I, I mean, I have like the, the quintessential starter kit, you know, for in my brain has always been like flannel shirt, beanie, learn how to make a bread or sustainable food item that I could sell on a table on the side of the street. Does that feel about right? Yeah. Like I, I went to this bookstore and I bought a book and I sat down to read for a couple hours and I got like a croissant and the barista guy was like, enjoy this tasty treat. I'm like, just give me the croissant. Yeah. I'm, un I don't I'm know. uncomfortable. I'm a little I'm crotchety. I'm uncomfortable oh. here. I'm sitting in a chair in in Metairie, and I I'm uncomfortable with that statement. I'm a little crotchety, but yeah, it's just it's just such a it's such a different flavor. Um, it's you know it's green. There's a lot of cool parts of it, but it's also like I don't know if this is for me. So a whole different vibe. Maybe maybe a little too as we might say crunchy for you. Yeah, it's funny, man. You know, like I, I feel like uh, I grew up in Dallas. It's like I'm, I'm crunchy compared to the people I went to high school with, I guess. But like, you know, I go here, I'm like, oh my god, I'm like Ted Cruz here. You're an interesting <laughs> cat in that way, though. Like that's, I think that's so we're a little behind the scenes thing. That's the one of the things I find super interesting about you is like 
I get all sorts of different vibes from you. Like one day we could be talking about like a Sturgill Simpson, uh, Sturgill Simpson song. And the next day, like it's something that is from the complete other side of the thing. Like you're, you're a versatile dude. I think you just like, you know, you dabble in a little bit of everything. You're in a little bit of every world. And maybe that's too like polar West for you. You know, I think you might be right. I am headed back to New Orleans today. Can't wait to watch these two games. The Pelicans will play in California, and I can't wait to be in the blender Sunday, game 82 against the Lakers. I wouldn't have it any other way. I would like to say, eh, the game probably won't be that consequential, but these are the Pelicans. Yes, the game will be consequential. We will need it for six, and hopefully <laughs> the Pelicans give us a tasty treat. Oh, all right, buddy. Well, uh, thank you for doing this. Stay safe with the uh, crazy weather y'all got in New Orleans, and I will talk to you again soon.